it is so. So we welcome you. God bless everyone. And those of you that are in ether land of the internet, we praise God for Facebook and Zoom and pray that you can see the video. Uh, if not, we'll make sure that we post it. But we praise God for our guests again today. This is Elder Anton Seals, Elder Jennifer Seals, and, and we are AJS Ministry and the Tabernacle of Fire uh, in you podcast. We come on every Thursday. We also teach on Tuesdays at two o'clock. Uh, but our special guest tonight on the Tabernacle of Fire is Reverend Travis A. Newsom. Uh, and we welcome him back. He was on last week. And, and even my son, Shimon, and, and several other people said that he did a great job teaching. He explained some things about the kingdom oh, uh, between the heaven and earth kingdom. And, and he said, I never understood that. And he made it very plain. And oh, I said, God. praise God. I said, well, he's going to be back on and we'll pray about it. And sure enough, you you contacted me and you're back. So Amen. I thank God for you. I just want to share with people, uh, not only is he an awesome teacher, but I want to read a little bit about his background uh, and, and about our guest, uh, Travis is an, is Newsom, Reverend Travis, earned his bachelor's degree in architecture in the in Illinois Institute of Technology in 2004 and became a licensed architect in 2012. He's a member of the Apostolic Church of God, where he serves on the uh, church board, uh, on the Apostolic Church of God Ministry Alliance, and he leads the church worship team, prayer team, and men's ministry. Uh, Travis does really have a, a, a passion for declaring the gospel, teaching the gospel, even being used of God to invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit in worship and things pertaining to the kingdom of God in both word and song. The breath, the depth, and the calling of his apostolic anointing allows him to flow as a spiritual workshop leader, singer, psalmist, preacher, teacher, and inspirational speaker. He is currently residing in the city of Chicago with his lovely wife and three beautiful daughters. Um, you can email him at Travis A, uh, Travis.a.newsom.ministries at gmail. If you're looking at this on Facebook, you'll see this in the in the uh, description box. Uh, we'll also post this and, and so that if you want to reach him uh, and invite him to come do a workshop or to lead worship worship service or teach. Uh, we want to make sure that we put him in touch with you. And his ministry is Tan Ministry, and that's Travis A. Newsom Ministries. We welcome you, and now we want to also welcome your dad, uh, Mr. Travis Newsom. We thank God for your son. He's truly a blessed man of God, anointed by God for such a time as this. And we just are grateful that, that we had the privilege of meeting him. And to all of you, I'm turning this over to Elder Seal so she can open us in prayer. And then I'll turn it over back to you, Brother Travis. Amen, Reverend. Well, Father God, we thank you on tonight for gathering up your saints of your people for the God so that we can hear what thus said the Lord. I ask you, Lord God, to let our ears be open, Father God, oh, and so that we can hear your word so that that seed can be planted and watered and begin to grow. In the mighty name of Jesus, I ask you to bless, Lord God, Elder Travis, Father God, as he deliver what you have given him in the name of Jesus. And I thank you and I praise you for all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I do want to share with you tonight as our special guest opens up, He's going to be teaching and, 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 and guiding us through walking by faith. That's his subject. Now, if the Holy Ghost takes him in a different way, that's fine. Uh, because I, I do believe that when God is speaking, be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but walking by faith, uh, the scripture text comes out of 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. And let me share with you, uh, listening audience and to, brother, uh, to Reverend Travis, I've been teaching 15 weeks on Smith Wiggleworth's book on faith. Mm. So, <laughs> so it's not by accident that the Holy Spirit has oh, given you this, and I thank God it's a refresher oh, and no. a quick of the Holy Spirit to let me know confirmation from my wife and I on this podcast that we're on the right path. God bless you. Welcome, uh, Co-Pastor Gay Chisholm. Bless your heart. You, you brought some more sunshine into the picture. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I turn it over to our guest, Reverend Travis, and he's his pastor. Let me let me be respectful. Pastor um, Byron um, Brazier. Byron. 
from Amen. our Father Church to God in Christ. We just thank him. I met him years ago. A wonderful man of God. Praise God for Apostolic Church. Um, God bless you. Amen. 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 Well, first of all, can every I know I may be a little bit blurry, but can you all hear me okay or okay enough, I should say? Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, uh, before I say anything uh, else, I just want to honor you, Elder Seals, both of you, Elder Anton and Elder Jennifer, uh, just for your hospitality. Uh, you've been very generous and very kind to me, and uh, you have loved on me more than I deserve, most certainly. And I just appreciate you both and uh, just the warmth that you both have extended my way is not taken for granted. And I definitely want to honor uh, my father who's on tonight, my mother is on as well, Mary Alice Newsom, Reverend Dr. Mary Alice Newsom. Um, I praise God for her and to Pastor, uh, Pastor Chisholm. God bless you both. I, I salute you. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's an honor and privilege to be in your company. Uh, I'm just honored to be invited back. I really am just a messenger and anybody who's called of the Lord knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we're just messengers and God calls us to give his message and it's an honor and a privilege anytime I have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we have already prayed, but I just feel led, if you would indulge me in a moment, uh, just to have a brief moment of worship. Um, and wherever you are watching this, if you would just take a moment, if you can, and just begin to lift your hands and just begin to thank the Lord. And It doesn't even have to be loud initially. You just, just begin to think about all that he's done. Uh, think about the fact that you're here. Yeah. Somebody is not. Somebody started this day and they did not make it to this point. Mm -hmm. Think about the fact that you're here. Think about whatever activity of your limbs that you're able to exercise. Think about that and just begin to give them thanks. Hallelujah. As we invoke the manifest presence of God on this line tonight, I do believe there is a teaching anointing on this line tonight, I believe that God is going to open up revelation, knowledge, and wisdom as he move forth in his word. And we just want to honor him before he pours out anything. It's in order to worship him. In fact, just indulge me a little bit more. Can we all just take a moment, lift our hands, and just begin to worship him in your own way? Amen. Just begin to magnify him. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Begin to see him in his greatness, in his awe, in his splendor. Hallelujah. He's the one who causes the rain to fall. Hmm. He's the one that causes the sun to shine. He's the one that orders our steps. Hallelujah. He's a creator of the universe. Come on, let's, let's just take a moment and get a picture, get an understanding of how big our God is. Hallelujah, God, we worship you. Hallelujah, Lord. We hmm. Glory be to God. God, we reverence your presence. We reverence your presence in this place. We reverence your presence. That's it. Wherever you are, just begin to worship him. Hallelujah. It doesn't even have to be loud. You don't even have to have the capacity to sing. It's just a matter of opening up your mouth and hallelujah, releasing a sound of worship. Come on, rehearse everything that God has done. We won't belabor here, but it's fitting before we receive anything from the Lord that we that we approach his glory with, with thanksgiving and worship and reverence and awe and splendor. Hallelujah. We worship you, Father. Yeah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And everybody said in Jesus' name, Jesus. amen, amen, amen. I'm excited. I love the word of God, and I love gathering with people who love God's word and who are hungry for God's word. Because if you're like me, you recognize there is so much more we don't know. How many witnesses do I have? With as much as we would claim to know, as much as God has shown us, and we give him praise for that. The more we learn about him, the more, the bigger we realize he is, the more we recognize that there's so much more that we don't know. And it is awesome to consider that the totality of his being uh, is, is summed up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it causes us to realize how awesome Jesus is. Amen, somebody. Glory be to God. I won't belabor. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will. Again, a quick hello to those of you who just joined in. We praise God for your presence. Good evening to you all. Amen. Praise God. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Glory be to God. I feel him already. I feel him already. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to read in verse 1. We're going to highlight verse 7. Just a heads up, but I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Hallelujah. And I'll be reading in your hearing out of the New King James Version. 
For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Mm -hmm. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, notice that he uses that word tent again. That's going to matter later. Lock that in. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. Watch this. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Verse six. So we are always confident. Highlight that word. We are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then we come to verse seven. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse eight. We are confident. Yes. There goes that word confident again. Pay attention to that. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Glory be to God. So this, this passage, particularly verse seven, is quoted often. I think of a well-known preacher who recently went home to be in glory, um, who used to say this every time he was on TV, a man by the name of Dr. Frederick Casey Price. And, and he would always quote this scripture. Oh, he always comes to mind when I think of this passage. Very familiar passage. And a lot of times we quote it to refer to faith generally. But I do want to honor the context um, in which these words are written. Paul is writing about the glorified body. We know, as Paul highlighted two times just in these eight verses, that these current bodies, amen, as beautiful as we all are, these current bodies are temporary dwellings. They are tents. And that's relevant because Paul, by profession, was a tent maker. He made tents and he knew exactly what he was talking about. And tents are something that we uh, associate with people who are nomads, people who aren't staying in a certain place uh, for a long period of time, people who are on the move. That is an indicator of our journey in these bodies or these tents. Paul is highlighting that we have another body from the heavens that is eternal, built by God, not made with man's hands, built by God that is waiting for us, that is eternal, that is greater, glory be to God, than these earthly bodies. And it's important to note because Paul is talking about some pretty fantastic stuff here. Now, there were those Jews even before Jesus came on the scene that believed in the concept of a resurrection, but they were relatively in the minority. It really wasn't until Jesus came on the scene that the concept of the resurrection became more substantive in how he raised the dead and in how he rose from the dead himself, as we all know. So Paul is talking about some pretty sort of, uh, how should we say, seemingly irrational or illogical things. He's talking about this eternal and glorified body from the heavens. And from those who, from the innocent bystander, from those who are deep or theological, philosophical even, this would sound pretty crazy, all right? Pretty intense. Not your everyday conversation, but take note, this is what Paul was talking about. But notice in the text, he uses the word in the English translation, he uses the word confident twice. The English translation translates the word that he originally used, uses as confident twice. That matters, he's confident in something that he has not yet experienced. He's confident in something that he has not yet necessarily seen, but he's confident. Uh, though he understands that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he did not necessarily, um, how shall we say, we, we'd have no evidence necessarily that he saw Jesus himself outside of maybe in a vision or the encounter he had when he was knocked off of his beast. He saw a vision of sorts, but he really didn't encounter Jesus like the other apostles, like Peter or John or James, who walked with him more so throughout his roughly three-year earthly ministry. So Paul is speaking with confidence about something he has not directly witnessed or seen, 
and something that seems quite extreme to put it practically, but yet he has confidence. In fact, go with me. Let's look at chapter four. I want to highlight something in chapter four and looking at glory be to God, looking at the last verse, actually, this is relevant. The verse that precedes the passage that we read, second Corinthians chapter four, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18. Watch this. While we do not look hmm, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now, practically, that does not make sense. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how church you are. I don't care how much of a deep theologian you are. You know full good and well that phrase taken at face value does not make sense. Amen, somebody. But he says, but at the things which are not seen. Hmm. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul is beginning to open our understanding about this reality that is not seen or that is invisible. And can I pause here for a moment? Whenever we see in the scriptures the word invisible or we hear about spiritual things, the presumption is that they are intrinsically or invisible by nature or intrinsically. Um, that is, we assume that they cannot be seen. But I want to submit to you that it's not that they cannot be seen. It's just that we can't see them with the natural eye. I want to let that sink in for a moment. It's not that these things are invisible in and of themselves. It's just that we can't see them. So Paul is speaking in natural terms, saying that they're invisible because he's talking about according to the natural eye. But clearly, there is capacity to see these things that the natural eye cannot perceive. And I want to give you a little bit of proof for that, just in case you think I'm going off the rails here. Uh, somewhere around Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. In fact, let's go there. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. And anybody who, was, uh, who I was blessed to be able to spend time with last week in the Word, you know we're going to be in this Word for a while. So you may want to keep your Bibles near or your Bible apps, whatever you use to get into the word. Hallelujah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Looking at verse three. Glory be to God. Mm -hmm. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Mm -hmm. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. I submit to you that the things of the spiritual realm, stay with me because we're about to go deep. The things of the spiritual realm, I submit to you, are of greater substance than the things of the natural. I'm going to say that again. The things of the spiritual realm are of greater substance than the things of the natural. We notice that's being evidenced by what we just read, that the things that we can see and perceive and experience with the natural senses, with the natural eye, we're created by things or with things that cannot be perceived with the natural or the carnal eye. Amen, somebody. So that tells us that the spiritual realm is more substantive than the natural. And Paul really begins to speak to this back in the original text that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, chapters 4 and chapter 5, and even toward the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if I'm going too fast, just watch the replay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Just stay with me. So Paul is highlighting that there is a spiritual body. Watch this. A spiritual body that we shall inherit. And it's not to say as if, how should I put it? It's not to say, Paul highlights and says, it's not as if we'll be unclothed. He highlights and says we'll be further clothed. And that suggests that in comparison to the glorified body that we will receive, help me, Holy Ghost, that are currently we're naked in comparison to the body that we shall receive. That's so glorious, so complete will our spiritual and eternal body be 
that moment when life swallows up mortality, glory be to God, when immortality swallows up mortality, that it's like, it's as if now we're naked. As, as beautiful and as handsome as we all look, God is saying it doesn't even compare to the glory that we shall receive. Amen. And that glory is more substantive and we know it's longer lasting because it is eternal. So when we talk about Paul speaking of things, uh, things unseen or things that are invisible, that word invisible is relative to our natural sight. It doesn't mean that it can be seen. In fact, we know from the writing of the Epistle of John, uh, 1 John, somewhere around chapter 3. If you look at that passage and skim down somewhere around verse 3. The, the apostle writes and says that one day we shall see him, for we shall see him as he is that one day we shall see him and be transformed, be like him, I'm paraphrasing. But it indicates that an appointed day will come when we will see God clearly. So that means he can be seen. So when we say that God is invisible, just stay with me, I'm, I'm camping out here for a while, for a reason. When, when we see scriptures that talk about God being invisible, it does not mean he cannot be seen. It means he cannot be seen with the natural or the carnal eye. So then that begs the question, how do we see these things? How can we perceive what cannot be perceived with the natural eye? How can we see beyond the natural eye? Help me, Holy Ghost. Because before this conversation, the question might have been, God, how can we see things that are invisible? But now we come to the understanding that these things are visible, we just can't see them. May I submit to you that on this journey of faith, that God slowly begins to peel back, glory be to God, the things that tend to blind us and illuminates our spiritual eyes so that we can see him as he is. Paul puts it this way in somewhere around uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, now we see in a mirror dimly. Don't see it clearly. We see something. We, we have a, a snapshot or a sneak preview of the glory but we haven't seen it in its totality, in its fullness. But one day it shall be made clear. We know that references, references the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When it shall be made plain that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and when all shall see him as he is. Glory be to God. Amen, somebody. Amen. So Amen. the question becomes, how can we see beyond the natural? How can we see beyond what we cannot see with the natural senses? The first answer to that question, or the first part to the answer to that question, it's by the revelation that God gives. It's by the revelation that God gives. The word of God, the written word of God even, is the revealed, is the revelation of God. It is the record of that which God has revealed. It's the revealed will of God. It's a revealed plan and purpose of God. And the written word of God reveals to us the mysteries of God that otherwise we would not know. So it begins with receiving the revelation of God. We know from Romans chapter 10, verse 17, says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We can't know what God does not reveal. We can't see what God does not expose in his word. So any capacity we have to see beyond the natural eye is first given to us by revelation from God. But we must receive that revelation. There are some, they would never think, it would never cross their mind. I know there's a season in my life, I was the same way. There's a season in my life I would have never thought to spend Thursday night getting into the word of God, right? Every, everybody has that testimony. Hopefully everybody can, can bear witness, can testify that they had those pre-saved days when they weren't necessarily excited about digging into the word of God, right? But he puts a desire on the inside of us once he causes us to see that this word speaks of a reality that cannot be seen with the natural eye. Very powerful. It never ceases to amaze me that in this book that we call the Bible, this great ancient book that it reveals to us truths that are relevant even today. Now, for those of you who uh, didn't join us last week, one of the things that we talked about 
were the Wright brothers, as an example, and how they're credited with discovering flight. And really what they stumbled upon, or put more appropriately, what was revealed to them were the principles of physics that govern flight. Those principles were already there. They, they didn't make them up. They were already there. The science that governs flight already existed. But they happened to stumble upon those principles that governed it so they can manipulate it and create this wonderful thing we call airplanes. The principles were there. Same thing with the word of God. This word gives us insight into spiritual realities that would otherwise not be known. And I realized at first, this conversation may seem elementary, but if you consider some of the things that Jesus conveys, it takes it deeper. Now, last time we talked about some of the principles of the kingdom and the power that God has given us. And for many, this is hard to receive, for all of us at some point, it's hard to receive, to be honest, because for, for us, it's not something that we have typically experienced. We weren't necessarily born in these bodies with a capacity or with, you know, with an awareness that we could heal the sick by faith, raise the dead, cast out devils, call souls to be converted by preaching the gospel. We had to come into that understanding. That's what Jesus is conveying to us. We touched on John chapter 14 around verse 12, when he says, most assuredly, I say to you. And you know what? Let me pause there. Anytime the master and the king of kings is inclined to add a little extra, if you will, to what he's about to say, that is a hint that whatever he's about to say may be a bit hard to swallow. He is giving you a heads up and letting you know what I'm about to say may be a little hard to believe but give ear to me anyway. He says, most assuredly, think about it this way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So truth is speaking, and truth is saying, most assuredly, I say to you, it's phenomenal. Truth is saying, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, yeah. he will do also. The works that I do, he will do also. Now for some, they'll pause there and be like, well, now, wait a minute. Okay, maybe that means he, maybe he's talking about loving. Maybe that means we'll be more loving, we'll be more compassionate. Or maybe that means preaching the gospel. It is inclusive of those things, but it's also inclusive of those other things. Remember, we talked about joint heir status. We talked about that in Christ, we have joint heir status with Jesus. That means that whatever, whoever you're a joint heir with, whatever they have, you have. Can I say that again? When you are a joint heir, whatever they have, you have. That's right. Oh. Can, can, we, can we go a little bit deeper? Jesus said, what you see me do is what I do, the works you see me do, these works I saw my father do. So I'm able to do the works of my father. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Because I saw my father do it. Are you with me? Now consider this principle. If God reveals it, there is capacity to repeat it. <laughs> I, I hope somebody's getting this. <laughs> so then there's significance in God coming in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, glory be to God. And he has come in a way that man, that flesh, glory be to God, can see him. And he does all these profound things in their sight. Praise God, that's why we have the scriptures. A lot of people look at it as a, just as an ancient mythical book but it's actually a newspaper of sorts. It's actually a journal. It's actually collect a collection of journals and news clippings, if you will, and letters and communications, emails of their day, if you will, that convey eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did. He did it in their sight. So when he talked about the kingdom of God being at hand or the kingdom of God being within reach, 
He not only declared it with his mouth, but he demonstrated it by what he did. And essentially he's saying, the reason you see me do this now, glory be to God, Lord God, I feel some right there. The reason that you see me doing this now, this is a sign that there's that power has been released, that you have now been authorized to operate in the same. That's right. Glory be to God. And I want to pause here because God dropped in my spirit. That's a sign of somebody. God has been putting some stuff in your spirit. And there's some things and some dreams that you have not experienced yet. And what you may not recognize is that if God revealed it to you in a dream, that is a sign that he's going to manifest it. That is like the permit. Can I put it this way? Any building that wants to be built, any, any, any uh, developer or business owner that wants to construct a building, any architect that wants to work with erecting a building, they have to get a permit from the city. They have, and a permit is a document that indicates that the city is conferring permission, help me Holy Ghost, for the construction of the building. So whenever God gives you a vision or a dream and you know it's from him, that is the permit. If God has given you the vision, that is the permit. Glory be to God. This written word is the permit. Right. The words of Jesus are the permit. Lord, glory be to God. In Mark 9:23, in Mark 9, 23, Jesus says, if you can believe, talking to a man who had a, a son who was demon possessed and the disciples could not, if you will, heal him or could not deliver him. So they brought him to Jesus. I'm paraphrasing Mark chapter nine. This man in great frustration essentially is turning to Jesus and Jesus is like, do you believe? The man says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord have mercy. We could camp out all, there all night. But he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible, help me, Holy Ghost, to him who believes. May I submit to you, whenever God says it's possible, that means it's permissible. Yes, yes. Whatever God says is possible in the context of what we ask him for, that is God giving the permit. No, we're not talking about wicked, wickedness and sin. We're not talking about that because it's possible to do those things, but it's not permissible. But when it comes to something that we're believing God for, when it comes to the promises of God, if he said it, that is the permit. Lord, I hope y'all get in this. Because sometimes we wonder, we say, I wonder if God, and we wonder about what his word has already settled. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting off track, but I'm going to flow with the Holy Ghost. We, we, we tend to waver. We tend to waver at the promises of God. And we dealt with this before, sometimes because of condemnation or not feeling qualified. And we fall back in, into what's often referred to as works righteousness. We begin to disqualify ourselves based on our own works or the lack thereof. And we don't consider that everything that God has apportioned for us, everything that God has appointed for us has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Our access to it has been paid for by the blood. Glory be to God. So if we sin, yes, we need to repent. Amen. We know that's not a license to sin, but once we confess the thing and turn from it, we don't need to be boggled down with whether or not God has let it go. It's done. It's under the blood. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So a lot of times we tend to waver at the promises of God. And we wonder, we're like, is that really for me though? The answer is yes. Turn with me. Glory be to God. I feel it. Hallelujah. Just raise your hand or type amen if you're getting anything out of this. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I feel him. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. We're going to look at. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Okay, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And in context, Paul is talking about plans or the making of plans. Okay? And so he says, beginning in, in fact, let's look at verse Let's look at verse 17. So 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? Mm. That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. In other words, Paul is saying, I, I don't make plans haphazardly. That's what he's saying. He was talking about his missionary travel plans in context. And he's saying, I, I don't make plans haphazardly. Um, he, I, it's not a maybe situation. And then he goes deeper, verse 18. He says, but as God, wow, is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Mm. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among, among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Watch this, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes. <laughs> Glory be to God. And in him, amen. To the glory of God through us. What does he say? Every promise of God is yes in Christ. It is settled in Christ. And because Christ has come in the flesh, and proven the reality of God and the grace of God and God's forgiveness and the promises of God and the power of God, we can rest assured that every promise of God is already settled in heaven. Glory be to God. So that when we pray the word of God, we can say amen. Another way of saying amen, as we know, is saying yes or it is so. Glory be to God. Can we go deeper? If you want to go deeper, somebody say deeper. deeper Hallelujah. Deeper. deeper. Hallelujah. <laughs> the written word did not precede the reality that it conveys. It's not as if God, help me, Holy Ghost, how should we put this? It's not that God established his written word and then work to make things fit what was written. The other way around. These principles and these things always work. But God, God allowed for, graced us with the written word of God that we might look into these things that already existed. <laughs> hey. I, I, I would encourage the preachers tonight who are struggling with this culture that is trying to change what the word of God says. Mm, mm. You can change ink and paper, <laughs> but you can't change what God said. <laughs> that's a, that's a worth the praise break for the preachers and the pastors and the evangelists. That's, that's, that's nice. You, can, that's you nice. can change the ink. You can change the language. Can't change this. You can put whatever cover you, you can put all kind of crazy things on the cover, but you can, you can do whatever you want. But God is so God that his word cannot be changed. Nor is his word intimidated. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You know, that's why, by the way, it's good to start getting into the word of God with worship and reverence. And coming into an alignment with the conscious awareness of how big the God we serve is. Help me, Holy Ghost. Y'all pray for me because I feel it tonight. And it's dangerous when it gets like this. I'm going to tell you something. It's dangerous when it gets like this. Because I can go all night, but I won't. God has provided for us his written word that we might get uh, understanding of that which cannot be seen by the natural eye. Mm -hmm. So we can get an understanding of those things which have yet to come to pass 
in the natural. They're done in the spirit, but they're not done in the natural. Now, I may have lost some of you right there. You might say, what is he talking about? So you remember earlier on, we were talking about how just because it's invisible doesn't mean it can't be seen. And just because you haven't seen it happen doesn't mean it has not already been done. I'm going to say that again. Just because you have not seen it happen yet does not mean it has not already been done. Remember, time does not envelop eternity. Eternity envelops time. In eternity, there is no time. There's just now. Whatever is, whatever will be in, in the spirit is. Whatever was in the spirit is. Help me, Holy Ghost. Is it okay? Is it okay that we're going this deep? Hallelujah. If it's okay, somebody say amen. Let's go deeper. I believe we have some deep people tonight. Glory be to God. So eternity envelops time. That's why the Bible says in the beginning, God. Notice it didn't say that in the beginning, there came to be God. Just says in the beginning, God, which means he already was, or shall I say is at the beginning and in the present and at the end, all at the same time. I promise you, I'm not trying to sound super spiritual or deep. This is the best way I can put it. He's not limited to time. So whatever he promises, glory be to God. In the natural, you may not have seen it yet. But in the spirit, it's already done. I'm going to let that sink in. Whatever God has promised in the future tense in the realm of time, in the spirit, it's already done. Let me put it a little bit deeper. You remember how we said that the written word gives us insight into the spiritual realm? Remember we talked about that. When God gives you a promise, in fact, let me put it this way. How many witnesses do I have that God has given you a vision or a dream and visions or dreams and you've experienced them come to pass? And sometimes when you're walking in, you just have to stop and just, just be like, oh my God, I remember when I was believing God for this and now I'm in it. Lord have mercy. I can shout right there. Lord have mercy. Glory be to God. So you know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. When he gave you that vision, mm -hmm. it's not like you just had an imagination. What God did is that he opened your eyes to see what was already existing in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was already existing in the spiritual realm. You just didn't see it in the natural I want you to think about that. In fact, Mark 11, verse 24, Jesus says, whatever, therefore, Lord have mercy. In fact, let's go back, go back to verse 23. Mark 11, verse 23, Jesus says, most assuredly, there he says it again. Note that. Most assuredly, I say to you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he shall have whatsoever he says. Glory be to God. Then he continues in verse 24 and says, therefore I say, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe, present tense, that you receive them, present tense, and you will, future tense, have them. <laughs> That's another passage that speaks to permit. In essence, Jesus is saying, if you ask for it, believe that God said yes while you get asked, and you shall have it. Lord have mercy. I promise you we're talking about faith tonight, and we're talking about walking by faith. Lord have mercy. We're not, we're not, we're not going to get, we're not going to get into all of it. We're not going to get, Elder, you laughing at me. I know you, you know where I am right now. It's, 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 there's so much, there's so much in the spirit realm. I'm trying to help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. Use Thank you, Lord. Use Thank you. 
when we pray, we are not informing God of our need, right? It's not like he doesn't know what we need or where we are. That begs the question, why do we pray? Hmm. We talked about, and for those of you, you may keep on saying, what is he referring to? Last week, we talked about the gospel of the kingdom of God. You can find that on Elder Anton Seals' uh, Facebook page or even on my YouTube page, Travis A. Newsom. Um, go there, you'll see the video. It will be great to reference for what I'm about to talk about. We talk about the Holy Ghost, how the prayer that Jesus taught really was a, is, was a teaching more, moment, more so than we realize. He, he is teaching us the will of God pertaining to us. He, that prayer really is more affirmative. And I submit to you that there is an affirmative aspect to prayer that oftentimes we overlook. A lot of times we consider prayer, we focus on making our petitions known to God. And sometimes that phrase is a bit of a misnomer because it suggests that God doesn't already know. It really more so is a way of us coming into an understanding that God knows what burdens us. It's almost like if you talk with those who are in, uh, who are psychologists or who are therapists or who work with counseling, a lot of times what they do is listen to their client. They listen and they allow their client to talk through those situations and circumstances that they're dealing with. Amen, somebody. And that is part of the work sometimes of therapy. That's, a, that's an aspect of prayer. That when we lay our petitions before the Lord, what we're really doing is that we're shifting the burden from us to him. And we're allowing space for expectation for him to move on what we're believing him for. Can I go deeper? That's why it's important to pray the word of God. I call it biblical prayer. Now, some people, they'll say they're praying and what they're doing is just wishing. We're not talking about wishing. And I, I don't mean to be insulting. I'm just trying to be clear. Sometimes we give God a wish list. We have we ask God to do all kind of crazy stuff that's contrary to his word. And we stumble into witchcraft trying to get God to do things that, that are contrary to his will. Which is a definition of witchcraft, if you will, using God-given power to do things that God did not ordain. Lord have mercy. We can camp out there for a while. I'll leave that alone. But when you pray according to what God has promised, <laughs> what that does is that that builds faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you pray the word of God, you're uttering it to heaven. But those same words are getting deep down in your spirit. And what it does is that it builds expectation or faith for, for what God has already promised in his word. Lord have mercy. Can I take a caveat here? So awesome and so loving is God. So, so sufficient, so secure is God that he really does not need our worship to be aware of his worth. Yeah. He doesn't need us to give us our petitions in order to know what needs to be done on our behalf. I have three beautiful girls. They're beautiful. My, my wife says they have me wrapped around um, their fingers. And unfortunately, she's probably right. I love those girls. And sometimes I will do things that they think they're doing for me, but I'm really having them do for them. Lord have mercy. <laughs> That's good. We, That's good. We, we talked about last week in worship. When we worship God, we are not adding to his value or his worth. That's already established. We're coming into alignment and agreement with his value and his worth. And in worship, in proper biblical worship, we are highlighting the attributes of God. And when we worship and we highlight the attributes of God, what you may not realize is that you are setting yourself up to reflect the same. 
because we were created to reflect whatever we worship. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. We were created to emulate whatever we exalt. We were created to imitate, to walk like, to talk like whoever we look to as our role model, as our God, as our go-to. So God created this thing called worship, if you will, that we might reflect on him. It's almost like Moses when he went up to the mountain. And my Missouri dialect came in. You hear me say mountain? The mountain. When Moses went up to the mountain and he saw the, he saw the hinder parts of God's glory. My God, help me, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. And just from looking at the hinder parts and coming down from the mountain, says that his countenance was so bright that they couldn't look on him. They had to cover his face because it was so bright. That's because he had spent his time in worship, if you will, or beholding the glory of God. Let, let me pause here. It's impossible to spend time in the presence of God and his presence and his glory not rub off on you in some, in some manner. <laughs> Lord have mercy. It's impossible to spend time in God's presence and it not change you and not impact you. Because in God's presence, our ego and our pride is stripped away. And he does something on the inside of us that causes us to look like him. We're still talking about walking by faith, by the way. Now, you may be saying to yourself, what is Travis talking about? What is he saying when he's talking about looking at God, beholding God and worshiping God and uh, looking at him and reflecting him and so forth. These all have to do with supporting a consciousness of faith, a way of thinking that is rooted in our faith in the word of God. The walk of faith is a lifestyle. It is synonymous to what Paul talked about in Galatians chapter five, when he said, walk in the spirit. Yes, yes. You can't walk in the spirit without faith. That's right. Because walking in the spirit suggests that you're walking according to the revelations that God has given by the spirit of Christ. And you, you can't, or I shall say, you won't do that without faith in him. Glory be to God. Let, let me share this with you. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That begins to give us an understanding of what faith is, more so the purpose that faith serves. But when we look at what faith actually is, I like to put it this way. Faith is the word of God settled in the heart. Faith is the word of God, the revelation of God, settled in the heart. Mm. When we talk about confidence or even a trust, it's interesting, my wife and I recently worked with establishing our uh, family trust for our daughters in, in the case that God forbid something happens to us, that we don't have to worry about things being properly stewarded toward them. Amen, somebody. Um, and a lot of times a word that's used to describe that is a trust. Uh, something that we put in store and secure uh, for use or for benefit. So when we talk about trusting in God, one aspect of that is leaning on him and depending on him. In doing so, another aspect of that is taking his word and hiding it or storing it in our heart. The psalmist in Psalm 119 put it this way, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Somewhere around verse 10, it says, with my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. The word I have hidden 
in my heart Glory yeah. to God, that I might not sin against you. Yes, yes. So the heart is the seat of faith. Mm -hmm. The heart is where faith resides. Ah, that's why it's not just enough to have mental assent to give your attention to the word of God. That helps, but in giving your attention to the word of God or hearing the word of God repetitively, sooner or later, you need to do it until it sinks in into the heart. That whole faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't necessarily just mean one time. It means hearing it over and over and over and over again until it rests in our hearts. And once it becomes faith in our hearts, once the word of God gets to that heart place, then it begins to influence the way that we think, the way that we operate, the way that we perceive, the way that we expect. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you're with me, somebody type and say amen or lift your hand and say amen if you're watching now. Glory be to God. Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, hallelujah, by the renewing of your mind. Um, in another place, Paul writes about, and I believe it's in the uh, second chapter of Ephesians. In another place, Paul talks about um, being renewed in the spirit mm -hmm. of your mind. Uh, glory be to God. That means being being renewed or being transformed in the way that you think. And when the word of God rests on the inside of your heart, don't you know that that influences and changes the way that you think, the way that you operate? Glory be to God. And how many know that how we think determines how we walk? How we see determines how we walk. In fact, let's look at the word believe, for example. I like to tell people that to believe something is to live by it. <laughs> to, be, to believe is to live by. And somebody may say, what does that mean? That means that because it's anchored on the inside of you in your heart, it shapes or influences the way you see everything else. That's why we, we went to Psalm 119, verse 9, where he said, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. If you're not careful, you'll skip over that, and you'll assume that the scripture says, by taking heed to the word. That's not what it says. It says, by taking heed according to your word. In the context, he's talking about his way. So in essence, he's saying, by taking heed to your way, heed to your life, heed to your situation, look at your situation based upon the word of God. Yes. Look at your circumstance being rooted in the word of God. Are you looking at what you see in the natural based upon your natural eye? Or are you looking at it based upon God's word? And the fight of faith comes in when you are torn between trusting your natural eye versus trusting what God said. Amen. How many know what I'm talking about? Say amen, somebody. Amen. And sooner or later, you have to make a choice between the two. And praise God, you don't have to do that in your own power. Go, go, go with me here as we prepare to close. Lord have mercy. I promise it feels like we just started. <laughs> Glory be to God. To those who are hanging with me tonight. Don't, don't, don't get me started, man. <laughs> for those who are hanging with me and hanging with us tonight, thank you for your patience. I hope I hope you're getting something out of this. I believe you are. I know that I am, praise God. Anytime we open up this book, I'm getting something out of it. First John chapter four, or excuse me, chapter five, verse four. Very familiar passage. For whatever is born of God, Lord have mercy overcomes the world. Watch this. And this is the victory that, that has overcome the world, our faith. 
In another translation, it says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. That means whatever you are struggling with, that you know is not God's will for your life. And you say, God, this seems too hard for me. I don't know if I can overcome this. How many witnesses do I have? Amen. Father. Lord have mercy. Amen. And the temptation is to quit and to give up. You have to ask yourself the question, is this what God said my lot would be? Is this what God promised me? And if the answer to that question is based upon the written word of God is no, don't quit on that thing. Work your faith. Now you might say, Travis, I feel like I don't have faith enough to deal with this. Okay, I get that. I feel that all of us have been there. I feel you. I get it. I understand. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Say what God said and keep on saying it over and over and over and over until that thing gets on the inside of you. Can I give a, can I give a quick testimony? I am a vegan. Let me be careful. I, I abide by a vegan diet. I'm going to say I am a vegan because sometimes that gives connotations of other things that I don't necessarily get down with. But I have, I have abided by a vegan diet since July 21st of 2017. So this July will be four years vegan. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And anybody who knows anything about Kansas City knows that it is, it is a barbecue city. The best barbecue, by the way. People from Texas say they have the better barbecue. Mm, I'll leave that there. Kansas City has good barbecue. So I grew up in meat eating culture. <laughs> the notion of not eating meat or dairy, by the way, no eggs, no cheese, was like, there was a time in my life that was impossible. Impossible. And over a certain amount of years, I began looking at documentaries and began finding out more about health and things and whatnot. And I felt myself shifting, but not able to take that step. I'm preaching if somebody's listening. I felt myself moving, but not able to take that step. Until we were watching something. July 21st of 2017. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to become a vegan. And I have not turned back since. And can I tell you something even more phenomenal? I don't miss meat. Mm. Now, I'm not trying to condemn the meat eaters. Don't, don't think I'm going somewhere. Because so, 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 church folk, you know, church folk, we fight over our food. Paul had the, oh, Paul had the vision that came down from heaven and, and so forth, you know. Amen. Um, or was it Peter? I think it was Peter. But anyway, one of the apostles had the vision that all meat were clean. So I'm not trying to, don't, don't get it twisted and say, I'm trying to say everybody's supposed to become vegan and it's a sin to eat meat. That's not what I'm saying. The point is I overcame something that I thought I could not. And it came as a result of being indoctrinated or hearing truth over and over and over again. And if it's like that for something that's temporary, how much more is it for things that are eternal? And I want to caveat here and say, I'm talking to somebody tonight and you're saying, Travis, I feel like I can't handle this. I feel like I can't overcome this. You're talking about walking by faith and seeing invisible things and whatnot. That seems too great for me. I don't, I don't know how to do that. Start with Jesus. Hmm. Start with him, the one who was born of a virgin, the one who healed the sick and raised the dead, the one who gave sight to the blind the one who raised the dead, the one who said that he would be crucified, that he would die, that he would be buried for three days and that he would rise again, the one who indeed was crucified and then three days later who rose again. Consider him. This book we refer to over and over again. Again, it's not a, just a mythical book. It's not a mythical book at all. It's documents, it's files, it's news reports, if you will, it's letters 
from people who lived in those times who saw these things happen. It is the evidence. Glory be to God. So when you struggle to believe that you're able to experience something that seems beyond you, start with Jesus. Let him be the one that determines whether or not you can experience it. And when you come to an understanding of the identity of Jesus, that he is God in the flesh and that he cannot lie and that what he said is true, then you have to wrestle with that thing. And you have to say that if he said he came to deliver you and to set you free, if he said he came to heal, that means healing is available to you. It already exists. Your deliverance already is in the spirit. Your healing already is in the spirit. That's right. Your provision already is in the spirit. Can I go further? That person that God has laid on your heart and you know they have not been, they have not been born again, they're not saved, You've been praying that God will open their eyes to see him. The reason that God put that burden on your heart, glory be to God, is that God has a plan for that person. You need to see them saved. You need to get that vision in your mind. I, ha I hate to break it to you. It wasn't that you were so spiritual. That's not why you got the vision. God chose to reveal it to you, and he calls you to pray. Bible says it's God who works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's not because we're so smart. Not because we're so intelligent. All that we know, we know only because God chose in his sovereignty to reveal it. And if he reveals it, that's a sign he has permitted it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. Do me a favor right where you are and just begin to close your eyes. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Mm. I believe that as, as we're praying as somebody's watching this video, you may be watching it now. You may be watching the replay. Again, time is not a factor with spiritual things. In whatever way that you're watching this, as you've heard these words, the Holy Spirit has been bringing you into remembrance of visions and dreams that were once dormant. And now it's as if the bones and the, and the flesh are starting to come together. Now it's now you're beginning to see that that thing was God. And you're beginning to believe for it again. In fact, I hear in the spirit that God is resuscitating your faith. Some may not even know that your faith has been on life support. Mm. But God is saying tonight you've received impartation. God is saying tonight, I'm breathing afresh on those dreams and those visions. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I know I'm talking to somebody. Just do me a favor. If I'm talking to you, say that's me. Whether or not you want to type it or whether or not you want to say it or lift your hand for those who are current with me in the Zoom, you say that's me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is saying that this message tonight was your sign. And the reason I'm bringing those visions back to remembrance is because those are things that I ordained. And this meeting tonight was an appointment with me, God says, to remind you that it was me who put it in your spirit. God is saying that what you saw wasn't a figment of your imagination. I was revealing it to you. You didn't recognize it as a revelation, but it was from me. God is saying, thank you, Holy Ghost. God is saying, that's why it won't leave you. That's why it keeps on coming back. Glory be to God. And I keep on hearing, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I keep on hearing resuscitation. God is resuscitating your faith. He's resuscitating your faith. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. God is saying that I'm strengthening you, strengthening you in the spirit to believe for it again. 
God says the reason that faith is necessary is because that faith creates a capacity for you to be a steward of what I'm bringing into your life. Ugh. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Just indulge you for a moment. I feel God moving and ministering, and I don't want to rush past this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I feel your presence. Hallelujah. Oh, God. I hear God saying that it's like, it's like you're right on the edge. <laughs> You've been believing, but maybe, maybe you strayed from spending that time speaking the word of God over yourself. Maybe you strayed from that time in the word. Maybe you've allowed other things to creep in and it's messed with your faith mindset. And you got off course in believing. It's not that you're not saved. It's not that you don't love God, but you've been distracted. Mm -hmm. Hey, glory to God. And God is saying what you've been believing for already is. I'm just waiting for you to believe for it. And I hear yes. somebody say, but I, God, I've been waiting on you. No, no, you haven't been waiting on God. No, you thought you were. He was waiting on you. Yes. Oh, my God, I feel this. The love of God and the grace of God toward us is so rich. Ladies and gentlemen, if only we knew how deep God loves us, how deeply God loves us. It will blow our minds. We wouldn't be able to handle it. And God is saying, thank you, Holy Ghost. It's almost like a river that God wants to pour into you, but it's blocked by your unbelief. Bible records that when Jesus went to his own hometown, the Bible says that he could not do many miracles there. Mm. Not because he wasn't willing. Not because he wasn't able. My, my God. My, 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 my. But because they weren't able to receive it. Yeah. They didn't have the faith for it. And I know I have some people that say, okay, Travis, you sound like one of those faith people that say you can do all this kind of stuff by faith and all that kind of stuff. Quite frankly, yes, that is what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying. Now, we know better than to believe for stuff that God has not ordained. We know that we can believe for healing, but God has a set time for all of us to leave. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Help me, Holy Ghost. But what I am saying is this, to who I'm talking to tonight, God is saying that, that that rebuttal does not apply to your situation. God is saying that I'm calling you to believe. And I've been waiting for you to trust me. Yes. And you might say, God, why do I need to trust you? Why can't you manifest it? Because when you're able to trust him for it, that is evidence that you are ready to handle it. Yes. And some of you need to thank God that he didn't bring it too early because you would have messed it up. Oh, 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 gosh, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. God, I feel God moving. If you're just with me, just, just sort of just lift your hands and just begin to worship him. I feel God moving. I feel him moving. I feel him moving. And some of you may be like, this is too, this is all super spiritual. I don't know what's going on. It's okay. Just hang with me. It'll be worth it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. God has not forgotten about you. Mm. He's asking you to trust him. Thank you, Holy Ghost. That dream that he gave you, I keep on going back to this for a reason. You thought you came up with that dream and that vision. And you don't recognize that it wasn't, you were impregnated, impregnated with that dream. God put it in you. Mm -hmm. And when you understand that, you won't doubt it. Man. Because if God put it in you, the onus is up to him to facilitate it. All you have to do is trust him. Mm -hmm. There are some of you believing for things that you haven't experienced yet. You're believing for greater things, and you're tempted to doubt because you're like, God, that seems like either too much for me or God, that seems too, it seems like too much. It seems like I'm um, not worth that. It seems like uh, too big. Um, help me, Holy Ghost. And God is saying, 
that if I can raise the dead, why do you think that's too hard for me? Nothing too hard. Nothing. I'm pausing. Somebody said, why do you keep on pausing? I'm pausing because I want it to sink in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, take, take a few moments and just begin to worship him. And somebody might say, what does that mean? Talk about how big he is. And if you need help, think about the stars in the sky. Think about the clouds. Think about creation. It gives us an indication of how big he is. His invisible attributes are clearly seen by things that have been made. Think of the greatness of creation. That gives you a clue as to how big God is. And God is saying, if I was able to do all that, why do you think your situation or your dream is too big? Hallelujah. Lord, we can go on and on, but I feel led to close out here. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We honor you for your presence. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Mm. We honor you for your presence. Yes, God. God, in a moment of transparency, I thank you mm. for the privilege that you give me to have this conversation. And God, forgive me if I come across in any way that would suggest that I know it all. God, let it, let it be known that what I share tonight comes from you and I'm a mere vessel. And God, I say this for the sake of those who are listening, that they might understand that as low as they may feel, as insignificant as they may feel, that I'm a living witness, yeah. that you can take nothing and use it to manifest greatness. <laughs> Thank you for taking me a nobody and using me to do this work. Amen. And let it be a sign to those listening that as low as they may feel, that you have ordained them to birth that dream, to birth that vision, that you may be glorified in and through them. Let their faith be increased indeed. And let us all be strengthened to walk by faith and not by sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Good night to you all. God bless you all. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Newsom, for the wonderful teaching. My heart, my spirit, and my soul says yes. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Ah, no, no. Mm. Elder Fields, I don't, I don't know if you have any closing mm. thoughts or comments. I know you always tell me I don't do that. Um, mm. But I can't help it. It's, mm. It is so rich. And God, so that for me. Frame a word from the mm. Lord. So you know, sometimes you just have to let it settle in, let it soak in. Mm. You know, you just let mm. it soak all in. Just meditate mm. on his word. He said, well, taste and see mm. that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. Can I sing uh, this right quick? Can I sing this right quick? Can I get this off my Can I get this out of my spirit and all my... <laughs> Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart to the depth of my soul, it's a yes, Lord. Completely yes, my soul. Says yes, oh, yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord, from the bottom of my heart to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord, completely. Says yes, hallelujah. I'll, I'll, I'll blame Pastor Chisholm for that one. That's hallelujah. I'll, I'll, blame take, him. I'll take the weight. I felt that, yes. I felt that, yes. Weight. When, he, when you said yes, I felt that thing, yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Glory to God. Yes. Reverend, I smile so much, my jaws hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Glory uh, to God. You know, I, when I when I think about the goodness of God, Hallelujah. And the confirmation mm. of of this message, this teaching. Um, when my wife said Rhema word, Amen. It it made me, it gave me when I started out saying, when your dad was uh, on live with us early on, and I said. Uh, this is confirmation mm. because I've been teaching um, 15 weeks on Smith's widow's work. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every week. Mm -hmm. I, have, I just added it up by the end of the, the 19 chapters. I'm averaging anywhere from seven to eight, nine pages of notes that I share every mm. week with the listening audience. Mm. That's that's close to 130. That's a book of notes mm. on paper. Mm. And when you can tap dance into that message like that, mm. that's confirmation. Glory to God. God is God is calling the world to a place of faith. Mm. Because we don't truly, and I ask I ask this question honestly to everybody. Um, I've I've been in ministry a long time. Pastor Chisholm, we, we go way back. Um, I don't hear the depth of this kind of teaching on faith. And I, I just, I know that, that it's out there. But faith is, is, is such a challenging word because it's, it's, it is God. If you look at, uh, I don't want to teach, but go to, go to Luke 8 and 11. He says the parable. Mm. The word mm. is a seed in this God. Mm. Substance of things hoped for is the very source yes. of who God is. Mm -hmm. So now you have hearing of the word and the word framed. So when you say that you, you see an invisible because you're walking in his word when you, when oh, you have mm. a relationship, I'll sit Close you in a heavenly God. place. So I sit you in a heavenly place to give you revelation, um, to enlighten you, because okay. I've called you to be my kings, my priests. Okay. I've called you to be my back. So why do you give you all this power and y'all don't know how to use it? Glory to God. And he's mm. calling the world back to a place of worship. Yes. That's what mm. that's what praying through the word of God mm. is really the purest sense of worshiping and praising yeah. him, because yeah. it takes you to a place of habitation. Hmm. Habitation means that I'm not just communing in the conversation. Yes. I'm, I'm habitating with you. I'm I'm dwelling in your presence because you call me to dwell in you because yes. you said I, I am the tabernacle. That means it is not that you're the tabernacle. It's just I, I dwell in you. Hmm. You're the hmm. flesh of the spirit that I created that I had to cover you because you're so powerful that you, hmm. you reflect me. Hmm. You, you are image of, so the greater grace is the word being performed by you. Hallelujah. You Hallelujah. That it's not just by, you, you don't know who has the faith and who has the, the faith of the mustard seed is, is really God's word. Yes. All you need is just a little bit. <laughs> so, Ooh. so, so, uh, what you did for me tonight is give confirmation Glory of why God. he put us together. Glory I just connected God. and asked and directed my wife and I to have this podcast Glory to bring to more and more people with a message from God. Hallelujah. And it doesn't just have to be biblical, mm. but God's word is moving in the universe yes. in businesses, 
and yes. politicians. To, yes. That God's raising up a remnant, Pastor yes. Chisholm, of mm -hmm. people, uh, Elder Jennifer Seals, co pastor Gay Chisholm. God has raised up a remnant of people by this worship, by this mm -hmm. experience tonight. Yeah. And 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 so I've been refreshed. Glory to God. And because for me, when you're pouring out, there's not too many places that you can go get poured back into, except mm. from the word. Praise the Lord. And when you tap into the well of the word, the living word, because you are, but there is a river, the rivers of living waters in you. Mm. So I just want to tell you, thank you for the uh, for the cup of the New Testament. Glory and to God. I close with that. Amen. Glory to God. God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. And so thank you for the bread. Thank Glory you for the to cup. God. Thank you for the water. It's good. Amen. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not wiping my mouth because because I'm sweat. That I'm just letting you know I ate, I ate good at the table. <laughs> I got to go. God bless you both. Love you. God bless, bless you. Bless Pastor Jesus. God bless you. God we'll bless see everybody. You I see you. We'll see you in a, in a week or so, everybody. God bless you. This is Elder Anton Seals. We're going to sign off. Thank you so very much. I, I yeah. lose track of time. Peace of God be with everybody. Thank you, Pastor Chisholm. Thank you so much, Travis, Reverend Travis, Newsom, everybody. Oh, Please, yeah. Elder Jennifer Stills, thank you for always being by my side. God bless everybody. We'll be back on next Thursday. We'll be on Tuesday. We'll be chapter chapter 15. Hallelujah. Bless your heart, everybody. Take care. God bless. Peace and love. Bye-bye. Peace and love. Thank you. Beautiful job. Hallelujah. Ending. Hallelujah.